the impression which the scriptures give me when I come to them with our commentaries is an ever-growing consciousness of their surpassing wealth, not only in regard to the exhaustless ocean of feeling which flows through them, but not less in respect to the thought that is contained in these words. I stand before them with a key which the church has put in my hand as one that has been tested through long centuries. I cannot exactly say that it does not fit, but still less can I say that it is the right one. It opens, but only with the help of the force which I apply to the lock. Our traditional exegesis, I do not mean the neologian, does give me an understanding of scripture, but it does not suffice to make me understand it wholly and purely. It brings out, indeed, the general contents of the thoughts, but it does not explain the peculiar form in which they are clothed. It seems to me that a thin veil has been laid over the text, even after it has been expounded. This remains behind on the word of Scripture like an irrational residuum and brings the Bible writers and those whose discourses they refer to into an unfavorable position. In fact, our Lord and his apostles wished to say only and precisely that which the expositors let them say and thus they have expressed themselves very unskillfully and unpleasantly, or, to speak more correctly, very strangely, and so have made the understanding of their word unnecessarily difficult to those that heard them and read them. The immense library of our exegetical literature seems like a great complaint that they do not speak plainly and clearly, do not speak right out, and express themselves distinctly concerning matters and for an object that are so incomparably important. But who does not feel that such a complaint does not really touch them? He who reads the Bible aright receives the unmistakable impression that the words and discourses are right as they stand, that these are no mere unmeaning ornaments which our exegesis has always to cut away, like wild vines, from the thought of Scripture before it can reach the essence of it. That the long practice way of the expositors of taking the dust from the word of Scripture, because it is so old and obsolete, before they translate it, tends directly to destroy the incomparable enamel through which it has streamed for a thousand years in the imperishable spring-like brilliance of eternal youth. The masters of biblical exposition may laugh as they will. It is still true that there is written between the lines of their text that which, with all their art, they are not able to read but which we must be able to read before we can understand the peculiar setting in which the generally acknowledged thoughts of divinely revealed truth come before us in the sacred scriptures alone, in characteristic distinction from all other representations of it. Our interpreters point out only the figures standing in the foreground of the scripture picture. They ignore altogether the background of it, with its distant, wondrously formed heights and its shining heaven of deepest blue and cloud, and yet it is precisely from the latter that there falls upon the former that magical light which, of its kind, is quite alone, and in which they receive a transfiguration which is the peculiarly difficult thing in them for us. The characteristic fundamental ideas and conceptions which lie beneath the way and method in which Scripture speaks, as an unexpressed presupposition, are wanting. But with these are wanting not less that band which holds organically together the separate thoughts of Scripture, the real soul, 
the inner and vital connection of the single elements of the scripture circle of thought. No wonder then that in connection with a hundred things in our Bible, which therefore remain still cruces interpretum, we cannot arrive at a clear understanding which recognizes the details of the text to have some motive in all their smallest features. No wonder that there are so many passages of which we have quite a host of different interpretations, which from time immemorial have been in opposition to one another without having arrived at a settlement of the dispute. No wonder they are false because all inexact, all only approximations to the truth, touching the true sense only in the gross. When we come before the biblical text with the alphabet of our ideas of God and the world, and we suppose, as if it were a matter of course, that that of the Bible writers, which stands behind and shines through all they think and write, will be the same. This, however, is only a delusion from which experience should long ago have saved us. Our key does not open. The right key is lost. Until we are put in possession of it again, our exposition will never succeed. The system of biblical ideas is not that of our schools, and so long as we attempt exegesis without it, the Bible will remain a half-closed book. We must enter upon it with other conceptions than those which we have been accustomed to think the only possible ones. And whatever these may be, this one thing at least is certain, from the whole tone of the melody of Scripture in its natural fullness, that they must be more realistic and massive. And there ends the quote of Richard Roth about our missing key. Our key does not open. The right key is lost. Until we are put in possession of it again, our exposition will never succeed. The system of biblical ideas is not that of our schools. And so long as we attempt it, Jesus is without it. The Bible will remain a half-closed book. That is a good quote. Yeah. And we've got the key. Mm -hmm. able to do a couple sessions maybe tonight yeah absolutely yeah all right good definitely can do two three sessions i'm i'm thankful with the extra time that i have i can i can do this all right looking, good. looking forward to it and uh i mean i mean i've been liking what we've been talking about the connection between gilgamesh and um genesis 6 and it's cool to see these other these other ancient stories line up it just seems like when you see these similarities it it, it brings a lot of credibility to um the argument of this actually being true um of course we're still trying to figure out that history but but i also like talking about the imminent kingdom of course i got your uh message earlier yeah. about that and that's a that's always a cool topic to talk about too yeah and we need to yeah because yeah. uh i don't imagine you've seen the comment from chris on the videos but I'll take a, I'll take, I've seen some of his comments, but I'll take a, a current look at what he has to say. That, the Bruno B-Sides video is real good, but it's kind of like a lot, a, a collection of really good to topics. And I think that, uh, I think a video that just kind of, um, 
lays it out more systematically would be real good. Yeah. I suppose that um, somewhere he told me, uh, well, okay. Here's the comment from Dawn. She says, you are making a lot of sense and giving answers for many things I have questioned. Where can I get your charts and watch other videos about theology? And then, uh, and then Chris said, uh, listen to all five hours in one session. <laughs> that's that, awesome. like, that's the, that's our kind of guy, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. I laughed more than you might imagine. Good then we share the same sense of humor. A lot of people won't share my sense of humor. <laughs> I like his comment here. It's wild when you compare the Bible to the other Mesopotamian literature, it's like God is telling us side of the story. It makes much more sense the more you learn about the surrounding culture. Yeah, That's kind of what I'm saying. It's like the Bible is really just a take on the true history that happened. And everybody has their own interpretation. And I suppose that the, the idea that the Bible has been served, preserved so much better than the other ancient texts um, proves, yeah. I think it's authentic, authenticity. Yeah. Um, and the idea that there were, uh, this previous video I put up on the Hittite satyrs, you know, the use of this name, Ephron, um, it probably indicates something like that. And people say, no, no, but it probably does. And maybe I should put like, I'm going to eventually give history from a guy, Barosis. And he talks about the Mesopotamians holding this view and stuff. So I should make some kind of follow-up video showing these ideas in other cultures. And then we have plenty of uh, stone reliefs and art and stuff to show, but... Yeah, I'll probably uh, show that text from Barosis on the screen and give a link to it under the video. But uh, that's something we should get into more. And there's a lot more connections in that. But um, let's see. Oh, listen to what he says here. Don't worry about whether people are ready to hear it. It's important that someone says it. Towards the end, I find the idea that we're on our own right now quite freeing compared to the dogma of the church. He's talking about when you and I were discussing that the window closed and I was talking about that, uh, you know, the different options there and stuff. Right, yeah. And uh, so he's talking about, he was watching Rise of Romanism, the window part four, Rise of Romanism. And, um, and this view really does explain the Rise of Romanism. And other views can't really explain it. They can prove it's not biblical. They can prove there's concepts from the third and fourth and fifth centuries that weren't done in the first and second. Like, but they can't prove why this happened. And it, it is a weird thing to try to explain. Well, this theology explains it. That's something I was 
thinking about talking about on this video we'll make. Somewhere in one of the comments, Chris asked me to dedicate a video to the imminent kingdom. Or he asked if I had a video dedicated. I see it here underneath the Bruno B the, the Bruno B sides here. That's where oh, he yeah, left. it's down there. A little yeah. further down. Yeah, and I said not really. Right now, the only thing I've put on the channel is in this B side video. You know, maybe, man, it, it this stuff is shocking compared to traditional theology but i think i think you and i and chris are kind of right about this i think uh i think there's a lot of people out there that are ready to hear this they're i think people are getting kind of tired of the way the church is run and this traditional theology of where it, there's just no clear answer for the grace and works dichotomy and i think they're kind of some people are really yearning for this so mm -hmm. It's kind of cool. I guess it's really cool to see so many comments and positive feedback on this video. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I can't get over the comments I've gotten on this video, which it's, it's you know, it's B-sides. It's, it's not the pre-Adamite exposition of Genesis. Right. Um, and that's okay. Because it is about the Axis Mundi. Here's the thing, Lane. We all have had some assumptions that are just wrong. And maybe if I explain what happened in the first century, it'll make some things clear. And I'm trying to summarize it. But God established an original Axis Mundi. And it was lost and the people rebelled. And at the Tower of Babel, he permanently disbanded the Edenic clan forever. Then at a later time, God decides he's going to restore the Axis Mundi. And he forms his own nation for this purpose. Well, there's a lot involved, but by, by the time we arrive on the scene of Christ, it's time for this messianic person to come and reestablish the Axis Mundi. It was the elect nation whose destiny it was to be this instrument through whom God would restore the Axis Mundi to the earth, Israel, by law, and they couldn't do it. And then God, by grace, formed the church with the power of the Holy Spirit and with a mission of her own to hasten in the blessed era, something Israel had failed to do. But the church also failed to hasten in the blessed era and the spirit ceased. And after that, we uh, didn't know quite what to make of it. And then history went as it did, and here we are today. That's the true history. All the churches with their theologies, what they tried to do is extend that window out and pretend we're still the original church practicing Christianity today, but without a Holy Ghost, I guess. If they'll admit it, I don't know. Right. But that's where they're off. And so everyone is not quite looking at this thing right. And that's why all the theologies out there, all of them, are not seeing things right. And they, 
they do not realize the church was on a mission to hasten in the blessed era, and we failed to do so. That's what people don't understand. Yeah, they really struggle to comprehend the true imminency that's talked about in a lot of Paul's letters. It's, uh, it's easily read, and this goes for a lot of theological concepts I've noticed, we like know that the current church, the 21st century church, isn't talked about in the Bible, yet we still think that we, we still make these connections. Uh, something that I talked to a friend about, uh, for example, was, well, the Holy Spirit today doesn't really work actively as we might think it does according to the Bible or something like that. He kind of works quietly and then eventually we god makes a decision on our lives and then they go back and say that must have been how the spirit worked in the bible well well no i think that the outpour in the spirit was incredibly evident yeah that's the perspective we need to have and then we look today and we recognize as um heretical as it sounds oh yeah we do not have this incredibly obvious outpouring demonstration of the spirit um long story short we've um it seems i think that an, the influence of the church today is trying to bring the bible into the 21st century when it's clearly not supposed to the other yeah. that's the they're, other thing i was they're go, refusing to acknowledge that the window closed absolutely and they're trying to extend it up to our day today and practice it right and it's wrong it's just a wrong assumption that everyone's making and it sounds kind of, and, and you, you, t you tell someone that especially someone that that believes that the the great commission still goes on today and you know they call you a heretic they think you're crazy and um it's funny. This that's something I thought about today before we're we're, we're meeting and everything was really the the the, the, the only change it, or the only major change between this theology and then the majority of others is the window closed. Right. That's it. The the, the early church had the imminent right then and there. That was kind of what I, I was going on that long rabbit trail to really say. We, we think, oh, the, you know, the kingdom will come anytime. Um, Jesus talks about, Paul talks about it right here. It's going to come anytime. Th having that 21st century perspective, not recognizing, hey, 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 hey. We're talking, you, know, you recognize that they're talking about right now, first yeah. century. Paul wasn't right then imagining that. when uh, a lot of these statements you have in mind when you say that, and it's more than just Paul, it's all around. Um, they weren't saying it can be now or it can be a couple thousand years from now, but hopefully it's real soon. Like that's not at all what they were saying. They, you know, so. Yeah. If you're able to see that eminence, yeah, we, we, we stress a lot because it's so important. We, again, we see it from a 21st century. We, as in the gen, general Christian church, see it from a 21st century perspective and fail to see the eminency and uh, I guess imminency is really the best way to describe it. And when you see that that imminency of bringing in the kingdom, and this great commission was not fulfilled, or at least the kingdom was not brought in, um, then it seems pretty clear that that window is closed. Right. right. And and out of that single idea branches into a cascade of differences in these and this theology compared to many of the others right right the basic idea was that israel failed to recognize messiah and they failed to recognize the time of her visitation and they crucified christ but then god raised jesus and this was a a sign to the nation and performed this outpouring of the Holy Spirit 
which was a fulfillment of prophecy, something that had to occur before the day of the Lord. So it confirms who this man is. And with spirit-filled believers, the church preaching even, Israel wouldn't believe. And so God hardened the unbelieving portion of Israel and poured the spirit out on Gentiles. And from here, the church was on a mission to reach the extents of the earth, wherever Jews may be dispersed. And Spain is one of the widest, one of the furthest places to get to that Paul was headed toward ultimately. And their mission was to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles and that would trigger that all Israel to believe and Messiah would be sent and the deliverer would roar out of Zion and so forth. And uh, so they were on this mission to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles that would cause all Israel to believe, all Israel to be saved. And uh, they were on that mission and we just did not reach it. And at the Bar Kokhba revolt, many Jews that entertained the notion that Jesus was the Messiah abandoned that and ultimately got involved in the national movement behind Bar Kokhba, who you might consider a false messiah. And um, so we failed in our mission then. And the spirit ceased shortly thereafter. And uh, I think the prophecy when Jesus says, uh, I come in my father's name and you don't receive me. Another will come in his own name. Him you will receive. That may have been a prophecy of Bar Kokhba. I don't know. Irenaeus thought it was a prophecy of the end times tyrant. I don't know. But that's the real history of how it went. And we're still saved now, and you're saved by just believing in Christ. God raised Jesus. This means he's the second Adam. He's the Messiah. He's the second man, the man from heaven. Right. But, yeah, and go ahead, Tim. No, you well, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, but there's, there's a a context, this original, while the window was open, if you understand that context, when you read the New Testament letters, everything makes sense. now. They just make perfect sense. And we'll get into examples of that. What were you going to say? Oh, I remember now. Um, now, the idea that Israel and the church failed, or at least the church failed, isn't directly talked about in the Bible, but we know that they failed because we're not living in the kingdom. Right. We're not living the blessed era. Right. And I think when you, we, when you take the scripture literally on how the spirit, the outpouring of the spirit literally worked, and we compare that to today, we, if any, anybody in their right mind is going to recognize that we don't have the outpouring of the spirit going on. So, and that was a huge sign. That was the sign that mm -hmm. they were in the, the, in a time, an imminent time to bring in the kingdom. Right. And I like how you talk about how the king, the spirit could still be working. Um, we don't really have any, I may be super uh, amazing proof of that, but he certainly could be in those that are, are that are in Christ instead of in Adam. Uh, not going to deny that, but the idea that there's no outpouring of the spirit is a major factor. Yeah. On that we are no longer in this opportunity to bring in the kingdom. 
Well, the spirit of Yahweh could be active now, like it was really any time in history. The spirit of the Lord can be at work. And uh, so we're not denying that. I think the fulfillment of Joel 2 is a very important thing to occur before the day of the Lord. Um, that was fulfilled and ceased. And then as far as this teaching that there's still an invisible aspect of that that continues to today, I just reject that. I don't think it's biblical. So. And I would now we don't have we can get into this now, later, whenever, but I just want to say too, regardless, you know, to the viewer here, regardless of the kind of what theology you hold, there uh, just please, you know, pay attention to the questions that this theology answers. That's probably the biggest thing is it, it might be a little out really out there and at first glance heretical and a major problem but then it's just amazing how many questions can now be answered because of it yeah um so please pay attention to that yeah yeah and just think you know is what i've been taught really in the bible <laughs> There's an awful lot we've been taught that's not in the Bible. And that's something that kicked me into my memories of talking with my old Christadelphian friend. Last time we talked and this material made its way into the B-side video, um, you were talking about, man, a few things we believe are just based on a verse, a little piece of a verse, a couple verses. And I was like, yeah. And I started talking about my discussions with <laughs> you really challenged me on that stuff. The kind of thing that I was just taught from my youth, he would ask me questions in ways that made me think, you know, is it really in the Bible? Is it taught, you know? And uh, you need to do that. You need to examine everything you're taught and see if it's really in the Bible, you know. And then, uh, and then there's things that once you hold this view, you can start answering some serious questions that people never could. This session's starting to run out of time. Let me check. Six minutes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is all the questions we can answer. And that's something I told a girl this morning at church. Um, she's interning with a company in town here. So she's been here for like two months. And cool. uh, I haven't gotten too much opportunity to talk with her, but I shared the channel with her and stuff. And I'll talk to her next week. But um, something I told her, she, even this morning, she said, so after 2,000 years, you figured it out, huh? <laughs> 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 and I just laughed and I nodded and said, that's it. That's right. That's how people will think. And that's fine. That's how I would think if I heard something too. You're like, sure, you know, this guy can't be right. Somebody would have thought of this by now. And uh, yeah, so I'm sure people think that, and that's okay, you know. But think it through, see what you think. You've never heard it before, but it's the simple truth right in your face, and it's been there the whole time. Oh, too bad. It's right there in your face bothers me is uh like you said there's been a lot of things added to christianity to kind of justify these questions we haven't been able to answer and um talking to my girlfriend in particular bless her heart it's amazing how there's so many sub the i don't know how to describe it sub 
beliefs yeah. that have been created. I, I it would take me too long. I I can't remember many of them and take too long to really dive into them and feel like we go through this never ending maze trying to to debunk them. Um, but it's just um, what's so cool is it's so simple now. Yeah. Yeah, it's unreal. It's how I know it's right. Yeah. The simplicity yeah. of the whole thing. It, it's really how I know it's right. It's why I think it's right. So. Well, shouldn't you have an active relationship with Christ? Shouldn't you live for Christ? Shouldn't you try to reach sanctification even though you're saved? Shouldn't you ask you for forgiveness because you still sin after you're being saved? All these things, man, that those are the big things I've, I mean, it, it stems out of a faith and work salvation, but many traditional Christians don't admit that. Uh, it, they, they spin it some sort of way where it's like, you're saved by grace, but you still should be doing some stuff religious wise, but it's not a religion, it's relationship. It doesn't matter. It doesn't save your soul, but you should still be doing it because it proved you were never, it, sorry, it just, it makes yeah. me mad because it gets so confusing. Yeah, yeah. Well, when they're reading the New Testament letters, they think the apostles are telling them how they can save their soul from hell. Exactly. And that's not it. They're telling the church how they might hasten in the blessed era. Exactly. Let, let's look at, I can go to a few verses. Um, what? Hey, Tim, we got less than a minute. You want to look into these verses in the, the next Zoom meeting? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to describe that. And no, it's not like faith and works are just Paul's trying to get them to do this holy living because their purpose is to get the, the kingdom and not to like you exactly like you said, not to save their own soul. Yeah. 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 I mean, so you can see it in a lot of verses and I'll go through it. Um, you know, there's all kinds of places I could go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll see you in the next meet here then. All right. Let me see. Okay. So I had mentioned that in the New Testament epistles, the apostles are urging the church on to holy living to please the Lord and usher in the era. And it's a testimony to Israel and everything else. It's not how you get saved. It's not what saves you. And there's a lot of verses you could go to for this. Um, and once you see it right, all of the letters make perfect sense. It's just people can go back now and start reading all these letters. For the first time, it'll feel like you'd read through and be like, oh, I know what these letters mean now. Um, Let me go to Titus. I would rather read it out of my Bible. I'd rather read it out of my Bible, man, than the computer screen. Let me just look it up. I could go through the whole letter, but I don't think I should. Uh, well, Titus chapter 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life. In the hope of eternal life, that is, in hope of life in the coming age, in hope to usher in the coming age. Which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, mine own son after the common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Well, from verse 5 forward in chapter 1, he starts getting into instruction, okay? And then listen to this in chapter 2. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, 
that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is on the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. He goes on to say, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. According to the hope of the coming age. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. And he goes on from there. In chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, you'll notice Paul's getting into his grace teaching. So in chapter 2, we have verses, or in chapter 2 and 3, we have verses that works-based salvation people will interpret to mean you got to do good works to get saved. But then when they come to chapter 3, Paul starts preaching grace. And that's this dichotomy that honestly the preachers in the churches around the country can't answer. They don't know how. They'll tell you you need to balance the testimony in scripture got to bring grace and works into balance but you can't balance those because grace disappears and what you have out there being taught from a lot of pulpits is work salvation and then at the end the preacher will say something like but we're all saved by grace we know that so it's by grace hallelujah okay let's close in prayer but the whole sermon was about how you got to do good works to get saved. And that's the problem. And I think the people sitting in the pews detect this contradiction and they don't know how to solve it. Yeah. And nobody has figured out how to solve it. It's because they're not looking at the New Testament letters the right way. 
They're not looking at the first century context of the events going on. They're not accepting historical facts like the ceasing of the spirit and so forth. And they don't know about Isaiah 60, 22. They just don't know about it. I agree. Yeah. I think, and, and the thing is, is like when the, the preacher, the pastor talks about, again, how to live more holy lives, it's, it, it, no matter how he spins it or, or they spin it, it's always related to like your salvation. Why, 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 why do it otherwise? Yeah. If we're saved by grace, to be honest, it's like, why am I here? Why, why do I need to do these things? It just, it's, it, I don't know. I guess what I'm trying to say is as you just go down to the, the core of this idea, it's to save your soul. Right. It must be about that. It, they don't know what else it could be about. It's about hastening in the blessed era. That's what it's about. Right. That's what people are missing, man. And it's the solution to the works grace dichotomy. Um, let me read another verse. And this one comes from Peter. When it talks about the when we talk about the faith works dichotomy too, man. There are so many verses um, without the right context, with not, without recognizing that we're saved by grace and this and the and what Paul was trying to get at, the holy living he was trying to get at was to get this kingdom to come in. What you're left with is so many passages and verses that encourage this, without the right view, that is, a faith and work salvation. Yeah. Tons. Tons and to tons of trying to balance it and that means that it's not grace exactly exactly and paul was not teaching work salvation even while the window was open you know it's about hastening in the era it's not how you're saved right the way you're saved is through the second adam romans 5 it's as gracefully as we are cursed in the first Adam. It's by grace. We're in the second Adam. We're in the first Adam and by grace in the second Adam. There's no reason to think it's by works. We're in the first Adam and by grace, God puts us in the second Adam. That's actually what makes sense. It's not by works. Heck, I almost give more credit to someone that would say, I think that we can still fulfill the Great Commission and it needs to be done by grace and works. At least they're, I don't know, at least they're willing to admit that there is, if you don't have the right view, this, this um, dichotomy. This, at least they're aware of that, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, even though it's wrong, at least they're willing to admit that. But, but, but then most Baptists align Christianities and related um, usually turn they they um they like deny it oh it's grace but then proceed to talk about it otherwise yeah maybe that's why the christadelphians have a lot of kind of good thoughts is because they they, they see they, they believe that things still apply today and they're just willing to admit that oh yeah we do have to live holy lives well right christadelphians are more honest than a lot of preachers in the churches because christadelphians will tell you yeah it's by works you know you gotta have the works and even if you're a baptized christadelphian only baptized christadelphians are raised in their view even most of those raised at the judgment aren't going to pass the test and they'll go to the second death and, and then that's really how they look at it mm -hmm. and and uh and it's it's works it's all about your works and but they'll tell you that they'll, they'll say yeah we we think you have to have the works to be granted immortality finally and um but they're honest to you about it 
they're honest about it. You go to a lot of other pastors and they'll teach works in as roundabout a way as they can. And then they'll top it off at the end by saying, but it's my grace and stuff. Now that kind of presentation, man, I find deceptive and terrible. I exactly. Can't, I can't stand it when I hear that. Yeah. And uh, so it's uh, even within like the church I'm at now, like it's so easy for me to see that that dichotomy, that problem happen sometimes multiple times in the service. Um, yeah. It's funny. I like what you said, though, um, Chris Delphians and people that believe that related theology at least are honest with themselves, um, with what the scripture is saying. But with the right view, it clears everything up. So the Chris Delphians are as wrong as anybody, but that's the thing, like people in these reformed churches, we have the doctrines of grace. They don't. They teach works, just like the Christadelphians, but the Christadelphians are honest about it. Exactly. So I was going to read First Peter. I don't know. There's a lot of things I could read. I've got a couple verses I could read. Let me read something from First Peter. Check this out. All right, let's talk about it. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. I especially like in verse 6 how he says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. And then he goes on in verse 7 to say, They're looking for the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's the opening in First Peter. And if you just continue reading the epistle, the whole thing is about this. All of the New Testament epistles are about hastening in the kingdom. So this thing that hasn't been ever taught to you from the pulpit is what all of your New Testament letters are about. Including the apocalypse including the apocalypse even. The Gospels were written to convince Israel Jesus is the Messiah. They pertain to hastening in the kingdom. The reason they were written, their purpose. <laughs> so in a sense, every letter of the New Testament pertains to hastening in the kingdom, and it's not taught. It's not a doctrine taught in churchendom, the churches of churchendom. <laughs> I probably sound like I hate churchendom. It's just people trying to worship God, so. Yeah, I think <laughs> trying to worship God and and spread a, a, a theology that at least is based on 
truth. Um, <laughs> it's it maybe not itself isn't true, but at least it's based on something that's true. And uh, just trying to live righteous, holy lives, loving thy neighbor. That's the best you know they can. You know what's funny about this theology is that I can say that all these people in all these different churches, including Christadelphianism and these other groups and Roman Catholics, like I've said before, I think they're all saved. And I don't think doctrinal purity is any kind of measuring stick. God knows our heart. He knows if we believe he raised Jesus and just save the world, you know, and, uh, I don't care if you get doctrines wrong. We're going to get doctrines wrong at this point when you look at things right. We haven't had the spirit for a long time, you know. And yeah. It's just, well, speaking of that, let me get to another verse that's real important. Sounds good. Yeah, it's just, I think uh, you had mentioned, and I, and I would agree that uh, I think kind of God knows the current state of things now, this... Um, Another thing I really like what you said is we're kind of in limbo in this, in this time that just is really weird. Like it's almost like it never meant to be, or it's just um, there's there's no way to like, no perfect way to solve like political issues and economic issues and a lot of issues. It just seems like we're in this incredibly complex time yeah. environment. I don't know how to describe it specifically. I mean we need the kingdom <laughs> exactly it it seems like we're just kind of in distress now more than ever um and uh yeah yeah well we're about 6000 years from the time of the original axis mundi and there's an old jewish belief that after 6000 years this millennium will come and it would be wild if they were right after all it would just that be yeah, that would be wild, man. Me nuts. Um, okay. Now, this will be very hard for some people, I'm sure. But maybe not. Maybe it's just what people need to hear because it's the truth. All right. And you've never heard this from the pulpit. In John 14, starting in verse 16. Listen to this. Jesus says, If ye love me, Keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. And that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay. 
So that's the first verse. How much time we got? I'm trying to look. It gave me the warning that said I was running out of time. Eight and a half minutes. Where do you see that? Um, I go to the regular page, top left-ish, right next to recording. Oh, I see it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so in John 14, then, Jesus is prophesying the sending of the Holy Spirit. Now, in 1 John 2, starting at verse 18, it says this. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Eternal life, the coming age, life in the coming age. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. Lane, this is describing people that have the Holy Spirit and have all truth. And they don't even need an apostle to write to them. Is that the position you and I and Christians today are in? No. no, that is not us. This chapter, First John chapter 2, is not speaking to us. That's what your pastor won't tell you. Wow. That's and, crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's the secret to understanding everything. In chapter 4 John goes on to say this in verse 13 hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit and we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the son of God God dwelleth in him and he in God and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Um, and it goes on from there. The love theme. Remember, God's forming a new council that understands love. John brings it out. Paul brings it out. You find the love theme coming out. And the New Testament apostles weren't corny poets 
writing pop songs. They were talking <laughs> about love because of the new council. And, um, but, you know, here it is again, but look what he's saying. We know we're in because we have the spirit. That's not us today. We're in a different situation today. It can be a hard thing for people to grasp at first. It's a shocker, but yeah, this is the key to understanding these 2000 year old letters you're reading. What was actually going on back then? Yeah. We got less than a minute now, man. <laughs> All right. Um, I got like, but yeah. I, what were you going to say? I was just going to say I'm ready for another meet. I can do one All right, more cool. meet. One more. All right. I got a few more things I thought I could talk about. I was going to enumerate the, the things that this theology solves. That Sounds be, good. That could be good. All right. Cool. cool. All right. See you in a minute. All right. The comment I was going to make after you kind of discussing that was, um, it can be a bit of a shock when you when the when you think about this for a bit of like when the, you read these passages and you take them the way they should be taken and you realize oh that's not us it it is a bit of a shock and even gave me a a, a small midlife crisis of like this doesn't apply to me this what do i do uh been taught about how i can i'm supposed to live a holy life my whole life yeah. and um, not to say that's still not a good idea for just practical reasons only, but, mm -hmm. um, but uh, to those that are kind of listening to this and, and get that realization of what these passages really mean, don't worry. It's, it's understandable that, yeah, it is, this is, it really will kind of take you back when it clicks. Yeah. Uh, well, and People don't have to agree, but what I'm saying, hopefully, if they think about it and just see for themselves, you know, they might find that this is true after all, but they don't have to agree. So you don't have to freak out or anything, you know. I don't make stuff up. I'm rarely wrong. Most people, though, I think this this kind of idea has never occurred to them at all. You know? Absolutely. You know why it's so terrible that we, the church, failed to hasten in the kingdom back while the window was open? You know why? It's bad that we failed to do that because now a 70th week of Daniel's prophecy has to occur before the blessed era commences. And that's also key in understanding things. The 70th week of Daniel was conditioned. Mm. Now it's not. It's coming now. And Paul gets into that. You know, something else, Lane, I need to mention. I've mentioned uh, other videos that Jesus, during his ministry, predicted both outcomes concerning the kingdom era coming to Israel. Well, likewise, Paul speaks of both outcomes in his epistles there's an optimistic outlook and a pessimistic outlook optimistic he says that these things will cease when the perfect come that's optimistic pessimistic he tells us don't quench the spirit and there's another pessimistic outlook in 2 Thessalonians 2 that I'll have to get into. 
And there's a pessimistic outlook from Paul in Romans 11 that I'll have to get into. Be ye not high-minded, lest ye also be cut off. No preacher behind a pulpit has ever told the congregation that that already happened to us, the church, and we failed in our mission. Nobody teaches that, but that's the truth. Yeah. I should look that verse up real quick because that's a real powerful one. People have wondered about that verse. And people have thought it, again, pertains to your personal salvation, your soul going down to that fiery pit. Let me see. Romans eleven seventeen, starting at 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, will graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be graft in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. Now here's the thing, Lane. God didn't abandon Israel forever. What this means, Israel failed in what she had meant to do for God, and so he's judged her. And he says, likewise, for the church, though, we have a mission to accomplish, and Lane, no one will ever teach that in verse 21, this is a fate that befell us as the body of Christ, because I can say that because the spirit ceased. It's because the spirit ceased. That's a humongous evidence for major, major things. That might be what hasn't hit some people, the significance of the Holy Spirit. Maybe people read past the Spirit as they're reading the New Testament. Maybe people aren't picking up on the Spirit the way they should. I think that's what, what it is, man. I think people see a lot of significance of the Holy Spirit, but they miss like his role or they miss um, they, they clearly miss the outpouring of the spirit now that ceased um but I, th I i think i hear a lot of people talk about the significance of the holy spirit being a big deal but they just miss the ceasing of the outpouring of the holy spirit yeah so maybe we just don't have a developed understanding of the Spirit of Yahweh and the Holy Spirit. And then I know that Trinitarians and Unitarians would have different ways of looking at all of that. But anyway, I think people lack understanding of the Spirit, its significance, the humongous significance of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and then the ceasing thereof. And we need people to acknowledge the historical reality that it did cease. Um, I can't believe I included Romans 11. That will be a controversial one. 
<laughs> but hey, I'll tell you what, man, here's the alternative. You could ask, does it mean you lose your salvation and you go burn in hell because you were high minded, so you're cut off now? I don't know. It's a good question for a lot of people. You know, this is a verse where some people see work salvation here again. So there's a lot like that. It's, it's everywhere. It's all over the place. They're putting these verses into the wrong theme. They're they have a wrong assumption they're starting with. They have a presupposition. They don't know of any other theme they could put these verses in. Well, I've got it for you. Hastening in the kingdom. It's a biblical theme that's everywhere. It's important. You can tell from reading Acts 2, Peter's sermon, and Acts 3, his sermon there. Man, that's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Repent, and he will be sent. There it is. It's right there. It's real clear. It's right on the page there, in front of your face. Oh, too bad. It's right there in your face. So you mean if I repent and Jesus will be sent in 2023? I don't know how you would try to apply that, you, you know, uh, hermeneutically applying it today. I, it just it can't. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So. It is, regardless of, of the controversy this theology provides, it just so simple. And um, well, I mean, and we've just spent a little, a good, some good time talking about how it clears up all these verses, all these passages. Let me enumerate some things that this theology clears up, and these are things that people have struggled with forever. They're stuck. They can't answer this stuff. They're not yeah. going to. They're not going to. They haven't yet. They haven't by now. They're not going to be answering this stuff. Well, this theology answers the following. The grace works dichotomy. The denominational confusion out there, the debating, they, all these people disagree. No one will ever agree. We will never resolve any of this. It's just going to continue indefinitely. The rise of Romanism explained finally, perfectly. Yeah. The origin of evil explained. That is a tremendous, tremendous aspect of this theology. The problem of evil explained. We suffer and die because we learn love as we do it. Every one of us down here has learned love to some extent. And that's what God intends. And that's what angels can't do. And that's the solution to the problem of evil. This theology incorporates natural history. There's no dilemma at all. And we can challenge the atheists to show us what this evolution is, this magic wand that mother nature waves around and organisms suddenly sprout new structures they can finally explain that to us i don't think they can and i don't think they're going to and the possibility of extraterrestrial life is real with this theology it's possible the two atoms occurred here, but this possibility is open in this theology. And that's why I named the channel Son of Bruno, Giordano Bruno, way back in the day during the scientific revolution said, you know what? I think those stars out there are suns with planets going around them with life. And maybe he's right. Wouldn't that be something? That would it, be crazy, man. It's all possible in this theology, man. So, I think what's cool, especially about the faith and uh, works dichotomy, 
that answers a lot of sub questions too. There's a there's it it there's just a lot of things I have encountered that are just completely cleared up. These things that have been added to theology to like answer the questions that the traditional theology can't answer. So the faith and works dichotomy that's huge. That is absolutely huge to get that completely answered. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big one. That'll help so many people. They've they read the Bible. They see that we're saved by grace. They see these verses urging us to live for the Lord, to strive for the Lord. It is hard, I guess, to balance that. You can balance. See, this problem's existed. People can't figure it out. This is the answer. And it always has been. It's always been there in the pages from the apostles. It's been sitting there for 2,000 years. So, And I think the other cool one that it answers is the why was the Roman Catholic Church created? Yeah. I mean... Uh, the blessed era, the opportunity, the window was closed. The opportunity to bring in the kingdom closed. So now, early church, the early church, or whatever, um, theologians, whoever it may be, just didn't really know what to do. Yeah. And they then <laughs> created a religion. Yeah. It's just that simple. Right. To get and they took yeah. baptism and communion and ritualized them and you know the whole story from there right because because otherwise you know what do we do then if yeah yeah no reason to exist right right we still have faith there's a body of christ it's those with faith we know he's coming we know though that there's a dark period that has to come and yeah. we'll have to get into that in some videos cool man well i didn't i didn't read roth's key i was thinking about that today i was like gee when i talked to lane remember how i mentioned to you from that one book by auberlin he talks about richard roth saying i can't find the key to unlock scripture oh yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about reading that quote and saying, I think I found this key, you know. Right. And um, I don't know. I'll save that for another video. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. I uh, thinking about what that uh, uh, that lady said to you at church about. Uh, so you finally found it 2000 years later. Um, we've talked about this a couple of times, and I just think that uh with the power of the internet information has been able to spread so quickly. Well, for thousands of years, definitely several hundred years, you didn't have that blessing and you had, well, the rise of Roman Catholicism influencing how you would look at scripture. So, uh, yeah, it seems kind of crazy that it took us 2000 years to find it, but well, when you have other theologies, Roman Catholicism and a for so long, a lack of ability to spread, to make huge amounts of information available, for example, the internet, really for any layman to view, this is the time to kind of view it. And like you said, we so happen to be kind of lying up with an old Jewish proverb of 6,000 years while we're at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that people watching these videos, they don't know me and you know and like she said i i'd agree with this morning you know it's like yeah it's this is an underdog theology it's new the fact that there's been so many men that have studied these writings and trying to figure it out you're telling me just now the person has figured it out that's doubtful it is. I understand that. But I would challenge people to think about it, grasp the concept, then read scripture, 
Read your New Testament again and again. Read scripture and see for yourself the ease you will fly through these letters knowing it's you'll it's almost like you already know what they're going to say and everything makes perfect sense you now know exactly what the apostles are saying and that's how you know it's right you know it's right by the way you can handle scripture with it it it's the meaning of scripture that's why that's why it's like that that's why the other theologies are awkward or they have their they have their things about them that you know just aren't right. So that's how I know this is the right view. So I challenge people, take it to the scripture and read scripture and see for yourself. And then if you don't agree, that's fine. And that's something uh, uh, Chris said, and I think it's post to me over at Facebook, he was like, I agree with some things and not on others. And that's fine. You know? Yeah. I know a lot of people like might not agree with what I think happened to Enoch, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe you have to think on that one for a while before you agree, or maybe you'll never agree. And that's okay. You know, but some of these things, I'm just sure you'll agree in the hastening in of the kingdom, which we failed to do, the closed window. That's something you gotta think on. And once it clicks, you'll be handling the Bible like a champ. Yeah. You'll put anyone to shame. You'll feel powerful. You'll have power pouring out of you because you know exactly what this book means and nobody else does. And you know it. It's almost frightening. So, you know, Chris asked me to tell him about this eminent kingdom. You know, tell me about this key you got. Well, okay, I'll tell you about it, but. Come on! Give it to me! You got it, baby. Look out, man. It's, it's going to change you. You're gonna change. Yeah, it, it it rocks your world. It it changes everything you've believed in. Um, but it's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. This theology's total power, man. It's just once you 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 have all the answers you need to everything. You don't meet too many people that would that genuinely would say reading the Bible's fun. Yeah, I love yeah. it. It's all I do. Yeah. Well, I can't say that, but no, I, I'll I'll admit too that I it's not all that I do. I probably could do more of it, but uh but what's cool is like whenever going to church or it comes up in a conversation, I've never been excited to talk about it before. Usually before I'm yeah, it's cool because I don't really know what I'm talking about. And now mm. that I do, now that I know what the Bible is really about, it's so much fun. Yeah. It's, it's exciting. Great. It is. I love it. It's my favorite book. <laughs> <laughs> Most people can't say that. Most people wish they could read the Bible more, but they don't want to. And it's because they don't have the key. Right. Yeah. That's what you need to write is the key to understand the Bible. You know what I think I will do is like record that Roth's key thing and put it at the front of this video or something. Like I wonder yeah. if I can record that separate and put it up front or something. I wonder how much time I got left here. It's you got you got over 10 minutes. The thing hasn't popped up yet. Maybe I could just read that. That'd be a neat thing to get on this video. I would like to get that if I could. Let me see. New York Times bestseller. Yeah. Key to the Bible. <laughs> Book will be five pages long. What? Yeah. It's this simple. <laughs> That's right, man.
That is exactly it. <laughs> but that's how you know it's true, isn't it? Yeah. And I'm not going to make a dime off it. And that's how you know it's true. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> free PDF. Anybody want to download? Oh, it's all free. Just come to the YouTube channel. Yeah. No, that's and that and that really is true. It's just kind of a, a slight tweak on this original first century time period, and um, the window closing instead of still, still being open, and a desire to bring in the kingdom instead of this personal salvation. And then it just cascades into all these different ideas from there. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but you know what, man? I think I have enough for this video. I was just looking at this from Auburn. I, I should read this some other time and make a different video on that. Sounds good. And uh, because George Peters gives his opinion on what that key is. And I almost agree with him, but I take it a step further and give the full key. So that'll be a video we'll make, and it'll be kind of like this one. It'll be on the window. So hopefully this will be helpful to people, though. Hopefully this will get them thinking. I can make more videos on this, talking about other verses. There's a whole lot more. Yeah. I could go through entire New Testament letters, though, and show how the whole letter is about this, all of it. Mm -hmm. So I definitely would recommend you said this earlier. I'll just highlight it again. I think hearing this, maybe watching this video, listening to this audio for the first time, you probably have a lot of questions and thoughts. I think. Um, as you said, it'll, it's very wise to kind of keep this in perspective and then read through the New Testament and figure out what it really is trying to focus on. Um, because otherwise, I think I can think maybe people like, well, what about this? What about this idea? And, and just well, hold on, just try to shift towards this perspective and then read the Bible with that perspective. And then you'll kind of see where, where we're coming from. And what, yeah. and what the New Testament authors are trying to get at. Yeah. I challenge people to give it a try. You'll see that the Bible makes perfect sense now. That's how you know it's true. And I'm just trying to spread it to others for free. I found it. I love it. I think it's the truth. Passing it along. That's what God put me here for, I think. I don't know. must be <laughs> yeah, can't, right can't be anything else <laughs> uh, so cool man yeah well good stuff this is gonna be a crazy video yeah i think so too when i read first john two and four and say this isn't us holy cow are they ready? People that have heard of hyper dispensationalism might be kind of ready, but even the hyper dispensationalists try to say that Romans and the late prison epistles are to us. I disagree. The window closed even after the apocalypse. All of your New Testament was written before the window closed. And that's how you have to look at it. So I'm hyper diaper. That's what I call it. Are you a hyper dispensationalist? Hyper diaper. Hyper diaper. Pun intended. <laughs> closed window hyper diaper. Yeah. Closed window hyper diaper. That is not the way you want to be, is it? It doesn't sound <laughs> sounds like a smelly little yeah. smelly little bathroom. That's what exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> uh, 
what I've, I've never made that joke. I wasn't expecting to make that awful, disgusting joke at the end of my video. Oh, cool, man. This is going to be a great video. Oh, yeah. I'm looking, looking forward to it. I have all the editing I have to do on the Gilgamesh video, but I might do this one first since Chris was asking for it. And this is really important stuff that nobody else has taught. So I need to get this out there. I think this would make a very good video or a good set of couple videos. Um, I think we've, I think we've, uh, we've done a good job explaining everything pretty well. I mean, we could unpack some things more. Yeah, if people have questions, no, people will leave comments in the thing, and uh, I can always make follow-up videos. And that's the human spirit, and that's what I admire. Give a rat's ass about football players or movie stars, any of that crap. But people that are trailblazers and buck the system, they're beautiful. They're examples to us all.